Welcome to the first episode of our series on the, the, the characters of the, the Fountainhead. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined this evening by Andy and Shoshana. And we are going to be kicking off this series you know, with, with a sort of emphasis on the psychology of the characters. But I, I find it almost impossible to subtract the psychology and the philosophy and, and all the other elements that go in there. We're going to be starting with with the the hero of the novel, Howard Rourke, and um, you know I I read The Fountainhead when I was fifteen, sixteen, and I it's one of the most exciting experiences of my life. I just remember it so well, and I just thought that this guy Howard at the time I was fifteen, sixteen, I thought he was just so cool, and then I later on in my life I met Francisco and I thought he was so cool. But, you know, when it, for a 15, 16 year old, how, why was this? Because you know, that was the context at the time. Those are the kind of words I used. Why was this guy so cool when he's a redheaded architect? He wasn't a rock star or, but he is a rock star in a certain context, but he wasn't a rock star. But, and it's, you know, I know, I now know that it's just someone with supreme integrity supreme self-esteem and so many other aspects but i you know i I'm, i want to to get to hear you guys talking about this because i've got so much to continue to learn about my favorite novel and that you know i want to pass it over to the two of you you know howard rourke let's start with you today andy wow i mean well first of all thanks for having me on uh you know the, these episodes here because one the Fountainhead is my all-time favorite book, fiction or nonfiction. And Howard Rock is my all-time favorite hero, you know, f fiction or nonfiction. So this is, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is really great. I read The Fountainhead for the first time when I was 16. And, you know, having grown up in a, fam a family that, Josh, I know you're a psychologist, uh, that put the D in dysfunctional. And of course, in a world that's often just as crazy as, as my family was even more so because it could be brutal you know, and murderous. Um, so reading The Fountainhead was like, it, it just, it opened up a sense of what the world could be, you know, that the world could make sense. And I was always a hero worshiper. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a lifeline, to, I, I realize now, it was a lifeline to, to what, a, what the world could be, what, what life could be, that, that life, the life's possibilities were not delimited by the, the, the sickness, the, the, the mental illness, you know, in, in my family. And so, you know, as a kid, I was reading, you know, a lot of action stories. So I love, you know, I, this is the Cold War, right, 1960s. Uh, so I was reading the James Bond novels, and I love Ian Fleming's novels. I loved them then, I love them now. And I love James Bond. And, but I never wanted to be a secret agent. You know, I just, I just love the, the courage and the, you know, standing up for freedom against, you know, the Soviets and, you know, and, and, and everything. Uh, and I read Shane, one of my all time favorite books. I love the character of Shane, the heroism of it. I love the benevolence of, of the story, you know, the way Shane loves the whole family. And, uh, but I never wanted to be a gunfighter. Uh, and I read The Fountainhead and, and he said, yes, you know, I mean, I don't want to be an, uh, an architect either, but I always want to be a writer. But the, the intellectual as hero, that's what, that's what I, uh, is one of many things that's so meaningful to me in The Fountainhead and in Ayn Rand's great novels. The in, that intellectuals uh, can be heroes. And, and Rourke has his own values, as, as did I. But unlike me, I was angry, rebellious teenager and tell my parents to go stick it and tell, you know, I was always in trouble in school and everything. I was, you know, I was an angry kid. Uh, not that I didn't have reason to be angry, Josh. It just wasn't, you know, it just was, was, it wasn't a good, it wasn't good for my long-term development. It wasn't in my self-interest. And then I read the story. I said, wow, you know, Rook stands up for his own values. He, and he's not angry. He's not defiant. He's not fighting. He's not in conflict. He's just him. You know, and you don't have to fight. You, you know, you don't have to, to fight against uh, craziness, uh, viciousness. And this was the 19th, late 1960s too. You know, the, so the new left, 
you know, you know, it was very, it was, it was similar to today. You know, the new left was dominant in, 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 my, in my high school, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn. And I, you know, and I couldn't join them to stick it to my parents because I hated the leftists more than I hated my parents. So I, could, I, couldn't, you know, I couldn't rebel. I couldn't rebel in that way, way anyway. But Howard Rourke taught me I didn't have to rebel. That was hard, you know, psychologically because I was, you know, I, I was so angry, but he gave me an ideal, you know, to, to live for the, the intellectual a, a, as hero who's in out of conflict with society, but he's calm, he's rational. He doesn't, he doesn't yell and scream and, you know, get, and get all irrational, much less uh, resort to violence. Um, and he's got reason to throw Peter Keating down a flight of stairs when Keating it's the kind of thing Henry Cameron would do. You know, when Keating comes to him with the Cortland, um, with the Cortland uh, uh, building, I mean, I mean Keating had, had said at the Stoddard Temple trial that, that the, the Stoddard Temple had no artistic integrity. And that's a lie. Keating knows enough about architecture to know that's a lie. You know, so Keating, you know, Rourke has reason to be, be angry and he doesn't treat him. Rourke's not angry. It's Keating, you know, Rourke realizes I do the work I love, and there are people in the world who will see it. I don't have to concern myself with the with the Keatings and the Tuies. The great scene with Tui that I, I know we'll get to. Uh, he's not, you know, he's he's fighting externally, but he's not in the inner conflict. In, 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 internally, he's serene. He's committed to his values. He knows he, he he lives his creative life. There will be people who will see the value of his work. There will be people like Dominique and you know and Cameron and Lansing and Enright and Winant uh, and Mallory, and he's he's at peace, and that's uh, that's what I what I love about about Howard Rourke, that the independence of his soul that gives him this kind of self confidence that he doesn't get he doesn't get rattled in the face of external opposition. He's just true to himself. It's is it, he's very noble, and I I. I one day I want to write an essay. What did I said before? Well, I, I, I've been thinking I would write an essay uh, as um, Tui as the greatest villain in world literature. But I think I think Rock is is the greatest hero in world literature. Or at least you can make that. You can certainly make that case. And I think yeah, and since I love Rock for that reason, I think I'm going to write that essay one day. I really look forward to reading that essay, Andy. It's just Shana. Okay. Well, when I read The Fountainhead, I. For one thing, I was uh, very experienced with 19th century novels, especially French and Russian. And this very much felt to me like uh, a Victor Hugo novel, except that it was set in the 20th century. So I liked that right away because uh, most of the other 20th century American novels I read were not like Victor Hugo. And so I thought, okay, this is, I, I, know, I, I know what kind of world I'm living in here. We've got a noble character. Other people don't necessarily see it, but the character himself or herself knows. Okay, so this is a story, and what does it mean for this character to be a hero? It means that Howard Rourke has clear goals, clear values, clear principles, and everything that he does and thinks and says is consistent with that. It's not as if, you know, he's a, he's a hero some of the time, and then he's got some flaw, he's got some uh, inconsistency. No, he's always himself, he's always himself. So I felt very, in a way, comfortable with that. I know this character. And so it's just a question of whether the rest of the world is going to live up to him, what's going to happen to him. Now, I was familiar with, from Victor Hugo again with the idea that sometimes the best characters are the ones he kills off. Okay, and that the mediocre characters are the ones whom Victor Hugo allows to live. And so I was somewhat concerned about that as I was reading it, you know, before I got too far into it, but I was prepared. I thought, all right, well, I'm glad to get to know this guy, even if something bad happens to him. And in fact, uh, if you look at the end of part one, things are not going entirely well for him. I mean, he's turned down the Manhattan Bank building. He's gonna have to close his office. This is terrible from a certain perspective, but I could see that it didn't feel entirely terrible to him and it was better than his having given up on his building and that would have been terrible. But I, I, I knew he wasn't gonna do that. And uh, into part two, which we will get to again, I thought, oh, this is, from a certain perspective, this is terrible, but it doesn't feel terrible to him. He got to build his building, he did it. He didn't change it. He didn't change the Manhattan Bank building. He didn't change the Sauter Temple. They had to do that 
to him, he got to build the buildings he wanted to build and he knew what they were and he doesn't have to be infallible. It's one of the things that we, I think it's kind of, it's maybe not surprising, but I was a little, I was very much enjoying it when I saw it, that Howard Work doesn't get everything right the first time, that his wastebaskets are full of drafts, but that's where the bad drafts go in the wastebasket, not out there in the world. So I very much admired the way that he was um, an achiever, that he was consistent, that he knew what he wanted and that he went after what he wanted and that this book was gonna be about him. And this book was going to be about, and that he, he knew who he was and we're told he knew what other people were like, even if he hadn't quite identified what the difference was between him and them. And I was a little younger than Howard Rourke when I read it. And I thought, well, by the time we get to the end of the book, maybe he'll figure it out. Maybe I'll figure it out too, because uh, you're just trying to see who he is and what, what kinds of events he lives through. I, I guess I especially liked just many, many dramatic scenes. It felt like, it felt almost as if I were watching a movie, some of the scenes, although parts of them, of course, there'd be voiceovers because we've gotten to get inside his head, but um, Ayn Rand's dialogue was wonderful. Very, very clear and vivid and stylized and dramatic. Um, I remember loving the scene where he comes to see Cameron and Cameron tries to throw him out. Now, I didn't think that Howard Rourke was going to let himself get thrown out, but I thought, okay, um, is this Cameron going to turn out to be a bozo? Is he a loser? You know, what's the problem here? And eventually, of course, we found out that he's, he's bitter because of his experiences, but he just met this guy. He hasn't even, you know, gotten to know him. He's looked at the, he's looked at the drawings. He's learning. He'll figure it out. He'll figure it out. And if there's still something within him, then he will want to work with Rourke and help him uh, become better architect. And Rourke in, in turn is going to be working with Cameron and helping him to recover some of what he's lost. So I thought that was very good that the scene was set up as a kind of yelling and you know, Cameron's part and pushing and, and, and so on. But I wasn't worried about that. I, I didn't think, oh, gee, what is he going to do now, Rourke? No, no. He knew that this guy was a good architect and that he had things to learn from him and he was going to make that happen. Now, I couldn't guarantee that Ayn Rand was going to make everything work out for Rourke the first time. And indeed, she doesn't make everything work out for him the first time. But pretty soon, uh, reading into the book, I did not think that it was going to end tragically. Now, I was familiar. I was very familiar with the play Sionne de Bergerac by Rostand, and this felt to me, not just, but wait, was I ever not surprised when I found out that Ayn Rand knew something about Rustin and about Fatigo too, and that they were favorite writers of hers because I could, I could tell, you know? And, um, and in Cyrano, he ends up being existentially defeated, but spiritually triumphant. And I thought maybe this is gonna be like that, but I saw how long it was and I thought, boy, that, that, that's a long time for us to stay with this book if he's going to fail. And, um, and so I, I didn't really think it was going to end up that way, but I thought, oh, if it does, okay, then I've got a long novel about Cyrano de Bergerac standing up for himself and I will, you know, not bending, not compromising, holding his own soul sacred. So I was a little bit worried, but I kind of kept going because I wanted to see, well, if the world was going to be good enough for, for Rourke. And, it, and ultimately it turned out that the whole thing was about... <laughs> Dominique reading this book and worrying if it's going to end tragically and not wanting to get to that ending, but instead that uh, that it should end with things being the way that they're supposed to be, that Rourke wins and the work the world is good enough for him, and which means of course that it's good enough for us because uh, he was good enough for any world, uh, but you know in the novel it's a question of uh, what's going to happen to him in the events, and. Since Andy went ahead and told us about his family, I will tell something about my family, even though a little bit of it is a little bit of a joke. Okay, when I read The Fountainhead, uh, the character I loved very much and the story was very interesting to me, but the, the, the individualism, independence, that did not strike me as a completely new idea uh, because I, I'd been brought up that way. And when I came home Thanksgiving break with The Fountainhead, my dad said, oh yeah, that's a great book. Uh, I wrote a paper on it in college. 
And, you know, and my mom said, yeah, I, I read it too. And I, I thought, oh, you know, and uh, they had not uh, given me the book or anything, but and I said, oh yeah, that was, that was a great book. And so dad went to the file cabinet and he pulled out the paper that he'd written on the fountainhead when he was in college. And I look at it and it's a typed paper, but there's a little note uh, attached to it. And the little note says, dear professor, I apologize for the lateness of this paper. And I thought, oh, my dad is one of those people with the late papers. I don't like this. I don't like late papers. And then I read a little further. I apologize for the lateness of this paper. My wife, who is also a student, is nine months pregnant. And so I'm typing her papers as well as my own. And that's why the paper's late. And I'm the baby, you see. So you could say that the fountainhead was being read and written about while I was um, in progress. Now, of course, we don't really believe that there's such a thing as a prenatal influence, but I think there's, you know, they, 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 they read the fountainhead, my dad wrote a paper on it. And in a way it, you know, it was, it colored their lives in such a way that they didn't even uh, sort of think, okay, we got to get our daughter to read the fountainhead because in general, I would just read books on my own. And uh, that was one I hadn't gotten to yet. I actually did have a copy of We the Living, although I hadn't read it yet because I was interested in Russian, you know, and the Russian background. But, uh, you know, in college, someone had uh, told me I should read it, and I, I did read it. And when I read it, they said, oh, yeah, you know, great book. So, so that's, my, that's my family story. Nice. They, hadn't read, they hadn't read Atlas yet, but they did afterwards. Lovely. Well, I'm glad your family was a lot better than mine, Josh. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I'm glad uh, you, you also referenced Cameron and Rourke. Because I, I, you know, I think you know, Rourke has these these sort of three great relationships throughout the book, and the first great relationship he has, I mean, there's the very significant relationship of Keating and Rourke as as you know, and Keating as the foil. But this great relationship between Cameron and Rourke, which when I reread Fountainhead last year, I, I I really focused in on that. I really enjoyed it. I've had people who are who are kind of mentors to me. And I really enjoyed seeing it that way. And, and I'm just wondering, Andy, what do we find out about Rourke from his relationship with, with Cameron? Yeah, you're, you're right, Josh. There's the three great relationships in Rourke's life. I, I, I assume you mean Cameron and Dominique and Wynan. Yeah. You know, his, his father figure, his wife and his soulmate brother. His, his really close relationships with Mallory and... and um, with Kent Lansing and, and Roger Enright, but those are the three, you know, monumental relationships. And Cameron's like a, a, a father figure to Rourke. We don't know, Ayn Rand deliberately shows us nothing about Rourke's family, right? So he's making a free will statement here. We see, we see a lot about Keating's childhood, a lot about Tui's, a lot about Winans, a little bit about Dominique's. We don't see anything about Rourke and Ayn Rand is showing us here that, um, Rock is rock, not because of who his parents were, but he, rock is rock because of the choices he made. Right? There's uh, the um, the the nature nurture distinction does not cover the waterfront on, on what makes a, a person what he is. We need to add volition, and I think Ayn Rand is stressing that here that that rock made, made these choices. Never, ne nevertheless, um, it's it'd be nice to have a father figure, you know, in your life or or a mentor the way Socrates was to Plato and Plato was to Aristotle and Aristotle was to Alexander. And you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, of this in, in the history of, of, great, of great minds and of people who, who are more, you know, more modest in their in, in intelligence. And you see, you know, I think, and I think Ayn Rand's also making, one of the things I love about the Fountainhead of many is I think Ayn Rand is showing us what family really is. This is a book about family. The Fountainhead is about family. And family's not about blood. Family's about uh, values and, and choices. And you see, and this is Rock's family. Cameron is his father. Uh, you know, Dominique is his wife. Wynand is, is his brother. Family's about, about people you choose because of, of profound value shared. And so you see the way Rock and, and Cameron love each other, like uh, they're like father and son or, or grandfather and grandson. In fact, one of the outtakes from the fountain, and I, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time uh, since I read it, but I think Rock decks some guy, 
you know, for, for criticizing Cameron. <laughs> you know, of course, Ayn Rand took it out because that's, you know, Howard Rock's not going to res re resort to violence. But, um, yeah, well, um, Cameron is, is a father figure for Rock, even to the point where you see the role reversal in, in their relationship when Cameron, you know, suffers a stroke and, you know, and of course he's taken care of by his, his sister, but, you know, Rock in effect becomes, you know, the, 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 a, a part, a part-time or partial caregiver who comes to visit Cameron, gives him, you know, spiritual fuel, uh, to, uh, to, to keep going. But yeah, and even, even before the strokes, you know, Cameron has these, Cameron has these alcoholic, you know, outbursts and Rock's got to take, Rock's got to take care of him. So, you know, there's a, there's a father-son relationship here, even, even to the, even to the, to the role reversal that takes place in the relationship. But Cameron loves Rock, and I, I love it. Even on his deathbed, Cameron still mentoring. He says, "Watch the plastics industry, Howard. Watch the light metals industry, Howard. You're going to have to show the fools, you know, what possibilities there are, you know, that that the human mind has has made possible for them." And it's, there's the whole architectural theme, you know, of the story that uh, that doesn't make. You know, Rock says this over and over again. You know, now that we have steel and concrete, you know, and, and, and glass, we can build a glass. How does it make sense to build buildings that were appropriate to, for wood? Well, now we with concrete, you know, and steel, we can build skyscrapers, you know, you know, and stuff. And Cameron's saying there's new forms in the new materials. There's new forms that are possible in, in plastics and light metals and, and glass. Uh, yeah, and he's mentoring him right on his deathbed. You see the love, you see the love uh, and the, the intellectual training is great. The mentoring is great. It's an expression of, of real love and, and, and profound value shared. It's very touching. It's, 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 enorm it's enormously touching. And I, I used it for many years when my college students could still read uh, for many years as the main text in ethics classes. And it was really sad. Some of them had just, uh, all, the, all the, the insight just went over their head, but there was always a few in class who got it. And that's very, that's very rewarding. Well, and I think one of the things about Cameron is, which happens in some families too, is that Cameron learns from Rourke. And because Cameron has felt defeated, he gives that big speech about how horrible it is. And you know the buildings that you could build and they won't let you build them. And you, you're going to cry like a, like a woman, you know, and, and uh, heartache and so on. And, and is this your future? Do you want it? And Rourke says he wants it. And then later on, Cameron says, what I told you then, that's not the whole truth. This is, it was worth it. And and Cameron is, is he's so eloquent. He looks at the, you know, Howard Rourke architect and he says, it's, it's like one of those mottos that they carve on cattle, castles and die for. And if you can just carry that through to the end, it'll be the answer to all the pain in this world. And do you know how much pain there is in this world? And you know, Cameron, he does know how much pain there is in this world. It'll, you know, the answer, to all of that, if you carry it through to the end, the victory for something that runs the world and never receives acknowledgement. Okay, you know, I mean, that's, it's almost as if that could be a, a central statement for the whole novel. You know, Howard Rourke architect, something that runs the world and that never wins acknowledgement, except now it does. And as you remember, I know later Rourke, Dominique, who never met Cameron, when she sees the sign Howard Work Architect for the Wine and Building at the end, it's as if that's the the bookend to that. So Cameron is very good, um, not just as teaching Rourke, but also that he's learned something from. I never thought I'd live to see it. Now he didn't see the Wine and Building, but he saw Howard Work Architect, and that that meant something to him. And I think that that's a really fine relationship because it is two sided. You know, that uh, Rourke had something to offer him and he had something to offer Rourke. And the two of them could offer this to each other because of the virtues they both have. And it doesn't even have to be that one is lacking in order for the other one to have something to offer. Although in this case, it is true that Cameron was bitter and beaten. But when he sees Rourke, he sees a different way that the world could be. And I think that also sort of foretells for us, in case you're wondering about Dominique, you know, and because, yeah, yeah she, Junior, she'll you're, learn too, yeah. You're, you're right, Shoshana, to Henry Cameron, Rock says at the Cortland, at the Cortland trial, you know. Yes, yeah. Very, very touching. Yeah. 
and and this brings us back to you know one of the one of the something that just dawned on me you know is that man is a long range creature we 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 live a long life we have to we have to order our life in that way we choose our value that's something you know given in objectivism and we see this in howard rock he exemplifies this around his highest one of his highest values dominique he's willing to wait he's willing to wait and um i think a lot of people are confused by that and i think a lot of people don't understand that when they first read it you know why is he willing to go through that and you know it's one of one of one of rand's tricks of you know she's 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 showing her philosophy through the novel but i'm i'm wondering if you could comment on that 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 we've got this hero who's willing to to really you know suffer in suffer in in one context but not really yeah yeah um, go ahead. who wants to go first uh ladies first they say okay well i think he certainly does suffer although as he says it all goes down only to a certain point but i mean here's the thing with dominique uh i think that he recognizes that having an argument on the subject of the world and philosophy and values and so on is not going to work. Okay, that uh, she's, I think as Andy sometimes said, that she proceeds uh, inductively and that she needs to see. And the impression that we have is that he wants her to see. And so if he's gonna wait, then she's going to wait and see and of course, he doesn't know that he's going to win to the extent that he does, but he will see, he will, uh, she will see that he doesn't get beaten. That what he's, that uh, what he goes through doesn't beat him. And she is upset, you know, because, uh, with, with the idea of greatness being mangled. And what he shows her is that, well, I'm still here. I'm still here. And the worst that even you can concoct doesn't, Beat me, take a look, watch and see. So I, I think it's, of course, you could say, well, couldn't we make this book a lot shorter if um, if they just had a conversation and um, he explained it to her, but uh, I'm not sure that a conversation is going to persuade Dominique because she hasn't been persuaded by any other, all of her other ideas up to now, they haven't come from discussion. They've come from what she sees and what she concludes. So she needs to see more things and reach better conclusions. And as he puts it, you know, uh, when she says, "Well, let's, you know, just be together," and and so on, he says, "No, that that wouldn't work. I I need um I need you to understand. You don't understand. I can see you don't understand. And when you do understand, things will be different. So I I think that you could say that if he could actually somehow change Dominique so that she isn't Dominique, but she's all of a piece too. She's got integrity. All the things about her go together. And so she's kind of got to change. She's going to change. It's got to be by herself and for herself. And that's, um, that's all there is to it. He, he can't just go in and change her any more than you can put a new facade on a building. She's got to change herself. So that's what he's waiting for is for her to change herself. And uh, it even kind of comes up when he talks to Mallory, who talks in a somewhat defeated way, and he says, why don't you understand, when will you see, when will Dominique see? And yeah, he's impatient, he's human, but he also doesn't cross the line into thinking, okay, you know, we're going to play it your way. No, he's going to wait until she sees for herself. And that's a big thing, you know, that she has to see for herself, and she is someone who sees for herself. But it, it takes a long time because... In certain ways, it's parts parts of the world are very dark, and he's part of what she needs to see, and and does. Andy. Um, yeah, you, you, you're making a, a good point here because Mallory asks him at one point, you know, "What are you waiting for?" And Rox, "I'm not waiting." Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and there's an important way in which that's 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 very true. You know architecture first foremost and always this is the love of howard rock's life and 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 he's he's moving he's moving ahead with the with the paramount love of his life even dominique as much as he loves her and and she she is 
and will always be the most beloved human being in his universe. But the highest value in his universe is not a human being, it's architecture. Dominique understands that and she, she loves that about it, which is what part of, of many things, which is so precious, uh, you know, ma makes, her, makes her so precious. And a lot of people don't get that. You know that you know, that that somehow they feel slighted that you know I may be the most important person in your life, but I'm not the most important thing, you know, in, in your life. But Dominique Dominique loves that uh, about where he's not waiting. He's moving ahead in his in his with the most important thing in his life. And like you said, you said Shoshana, he's he has a a lot of confidence in the Rook has like like his creator at the end of the day although there's a lot of people who don't get it, won't get it, don't want to get it. Ayn Rand has a great deal of respect for mankind, for, for the, you know, for the rational capacity to see first. Yes. And Rock has that respect for his brothers and sisters. And he certainly has it for Dominique. And, and he certainly expects that Dominique will see it in time. And she does. He's right. His judgment is vindicated over and over again in, in this story. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's right about uh, architecture. He's right about Dominique. He's right about Winant, I think. Well, the Winant makes the, uh, the bad choice. Uh, over and over again, we see Rock's judgment vindicated, one of many things about him that makes him such a great hero. So one thing, you know, I, I, I'm bringing it back to myself and my own experience of this novel when I was... Uh, 15, 16, because it had such a profound impact on me. Howard Rourke did two, there were two things that really stood out to me in you know, the first half of the novel as just being at that age, super cool, you know, super confident. And one scene I want to discuss with you now and just want to see your take on it and why you might think it might've been so powerful to someone like me that then is when he, he, you know, in many ways, I see Harry Rourke as a man who doesn't say it. You know, he's a man of few words in many ways. He's a man of action. And when he's uh, when he presents the photographs, he doesn't he doesn't defend what he's done in another way. He presents the photographs of his work. And I remember just kind of like, and Ayn Rand does this time and time again in her books. I have this idea of she's going to do this, and she does something much more profound and even deeper than. I was kind of hoping for and that you know when I, I remember sort of shivering and with sort of kind of pride was it pride or just like I don't just shivering in, in in kind of a sort of sense of joy as well in 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 that scene of this this man is just this is my work these are the photographs of my work and I, I'm curious to see why you might think that was so powerful for for you know for an adolescent like me at the time well, you know, I think that um, it's the opposite of the way the whole trial has been going with all these people making speeches. And so now, of course, he learns how to make a speech and you know, the speech yeah. comes up in a different when he has actually basically invited the world to put him on trial. So he could make the speech and say what he says. But here, you know, this they've been talking about the building. OK, here's the building. Here it is. Here's what you've been talking about. And it's different from what you've been saying now. The, the idea of the thing itself being the evidence actually fits in very well with what we were just saying about Dominique, because that's his answer to her. You think that the, the world is a place where uh, greatness has no chance? Well, welcome to reality. Take a look. You know, that's it. You know, of course, it's, it's not just photographs. She's got to see experience over time, but that's the argument. It's not something abstract removed from the concretes. Here it is. Here it is. Here, here's my building. And well, I'm sure you know this, but all the way through uh, a building is like a man. It can have integrity or, you know, as seldom as, as a man does. And the way that when he's with the Manhattan Bank building and he's refused uh, the, the compromise suggested, he gathers up his drawings and he holds them close. You know, it's um. Here it is. Here's my. You know, here's myself. Here it is. This is what you're putting on trial. Take a look. Um, and what what you see, I, I think, is that um, he is. What you said about a man of few words. Yes, he's not Winand. Winand is a man of lots of words. Winand's a writer, and uh, Rourke less so. He talks in his buildings. 
And that's actually how he, that's how he got his um, hearing with Cameron, right? Here, what did they kick you out for these? And then, uh, right? And then Cameron takes a look and, um, and now he knows who this man is. So I think it fits in very well with my work done my way, that's all I am. Here it is. So yeah, that's, it's very powerful in that we've got it presented right in front of us the very thing that he's doing is presenting something in its essence. So yeah, that 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 it is a very powerful sequence. I like yeah. I like that too. Yeah, me three. I mean, architecture is a very visual genre, and so you know, photographs speak 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 very speak loudly. And and here the the studded temple, rock knows. He knows architecture. He knows the history of architecture. He knows architecture better than anybody in the universe of this story. He knows this is a masterpiece. He has no doubt of it. It's hundred percent. He 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 knows, and he could establish it uh, objectively by reference to the to the to the nature of the field. By you know what 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 makes a what makes a building great. He could give a whole discourse on this. Uh, but visually, it's stunning. The the and the way Ayn Rand describes it is just. It's just like you know, it's like a Frank Lloyd Wright design. It's just it's just visually arresting, and you put that down there. As, what else do you need? It's this. You could listen to all these people pontificate, or you could take a look at the building yourself with your own eyes, see it with your own eyes, understand it with your with your own mind. Do this first handed because architecture is visual. Look at it. Just you know, look at it. You don't need a uh, you don't need a book or or, or a discourse to to explain it. Just look, and you and, and anybody who's honest has got to be. Wow, that is that is impressive. I've never seen a real destruction like that before. Doesn't matter, you know. Prior to the Wright brothers, nobody had ever seen anybody fly either. <laughs> this is this is this is the first time, and this is visually stunning. So I can see why you were you know you were struck by it in that in, in that way, Josh. As yeah. bold. You know, it's bold. And it's also, it, like, what I like about it, again, it's respectful of human intelligence. He's respecting, you know, the human race and the people in this courtroom. You're human beings, just like me. You've got eyes to see. You've got a brain to, to understand. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to follow the, the herd here. We're not, we're not sheep. Look, think, make your, make your own judgment. I'm confident this is a masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's what really struck me at the time. Was just that confidence. supreme that supreme confidence yeah. and yeah. and the integrity. Right. I remember reading the book, fantasizing about when Rourke would meet Tui, or hoping that he would meet Tui, and that he would slay Tui somehow, and there would be this like, you know, almost a bit like a sort of some kind of heroic battle or something like that. You know, like that. You know, as as kind of teenagers think. And I, I, I could never have imagined something so powerful as that scene when they bump into each other in the street. And he asked him, what do you think of me? And when I read, what do you think of me? I, I can't remember, does he say, what do you think of me, Mr. Rourke, or something like that. And I, tell and me I was, in any words you choose. In any, tell me in any way, you, any words you choose. And there's, I, nobody, there's, nobody here to, there's nobody else here to, to, yeah. hear, to hear you. Exactly. And I, and I was thinking, great, he's going to slam him. You know, he's going to slam him with some kind of, you know, something, some kind of epic. I, I don't want to say rant, but something like that. And, and we get, yeah. but, but I don't think of you. And it, it was just one of the most powerful things I've ever read, witnessed, seen. I, 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 it was just, again, as I said earlier, just on such another level. And yet so simple. Right. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, already I'm, I'm sort of experienced. Yeah, it, when we talk about art giving you strength, that's a scene in, this, in the same way that the boy, and, boy in the bicycle gives me a certain kind of power or strength. This, this scene does as well in terms of in, inspiration. And maybe Shoshana, maybe you could start on, you know, why is this just such a powerful scene? And also it, it shows how Rourke, just the whole essence of Rourke in, in that in that moment. Well, it's, it certainly does because this particular uh, adventure was concocted on purpose by Tui as a way of destroying Rourke. 
Okay, that's what he wanted to do. And of course, he's got the building and he's in, he can mangle that building, but he can't touch this man. And that's what he sees here is that um, he can't touch this man because Rourke is still what he is and he still has his ability. And Tui has not succeeded because here's the thing about Tui. He wants, he's got nothing that he actually wants for himself. He's just about power. And this is a man he can't have any power over. This man is beyond his power. And so he's done this whole trick and it's as if he gave a war and nobody came. You know, Rourke's, Rourke's un, un, Rourke has seen what happened to the building, but that didn't happen to him because he built the building first. And as a matter of fact, he built the building. Thank you, Tui. You know, he, he got to build the building regardless of what happened to it afterwards. Now, he doesn't actually throw that in Tui's face, but it's true that he's proud of that building and, and of what he did. And that can't be taken away from him. And yet, of course, he's not going to talk to Tui about his love for his work. He's just going to not give Tui what Tui wants. What Tui wants is some acknowledgement of you won. No, he didn't win. He didn't win anything. And here's the thing. Uh, when they first laid eyes on each other and at the Enright House party and Tui looks at Rourke and he thinks about falling out of a window, you know, and hitting the ground, Rourke doesn't register him at all. For that, that night we're told Tui saw nothing but Rourke and Rourke didn't even know that Tui was in the room. And you know something? Rourke still doesn't know that Tui's in the room in an important sense. Yes, you did this, you did a trick. He knows that, but he doesn't have to talk about it with this guy. He's not going to beg. He's not because, you know, let's let's make it. No, he's got nothing to say to him. He's not thinking about him. And you could say, uh, you, well, remember later on the question of Mananic Valley, what's the trick this time? But he goes ahead and he builds that anyway. And um, he doesn't spend his time thinking, oh, no, what mean trick is Tui going to play on me? No, he just goes and builds what he builds. So he's not thinking about now he does he he is aware that he's evil and it is important to know what evil is and not to get confused about that not to trust someone who is evil but he doesn't think about him in the sense of he's not going to go living his life figuring that every commission might be hopped and stoddard being the the uh the ventriloquist dummy for ellsworth tui he's not going to let tui get him to not take work. Okay. I don't think about you. You aren't changing my life. You can change my building, but you can't change my life. So I, I think that's very powerful because Tui, all he wants is he wants everybody to be under his control. As soon as he saw this man, he thought, oh, oh, this one I can't control. And you know something? He still hasn't. He still hasn't, hasn't done that. And um, so he's lost. I mean, it looks as if he's, he, he could think he's won because he took the building, but he didn't win because the man's still alive and he didn't beat him. And Tui is all about beating other people because he's got nothing of his own to care about. It's all about beating other people. And this is a man he really wanted to beat and it didn't work. You lost, you know, you lost. Um, now, I guess there's a line that comes to me and I don't, well, I don't want us to take away from the fountainhead, but it just, when I was a child, it was something that mattered a lot to me. And that's when I saw the Wizard of Oz, you know, the Wizard of Oz, the movie. Sure. And sure. And we got the, you know, the one evil witch has been crushed and the new evil witch, the other is, you know, Wicker's List shown up. And then there's the good witch. And the good witch says to Glinda, says the evil witch, you have no power here. Be gone before someone drops a house on you. <laughs> and I, right? And I guess I always love that. You have no power here. You have no power here. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that Howard Rourke is Glinda the Good Witch, but you know, you have no power here. You have no that's power great. here. That's, yeah. that's a great analogy, Shoshana. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, th this is the end of, of part two, and it's, and right. it's seen, that, narrated by Tui, as I, as I recall, right? Now, I haven't read The Fountainhead in many years. Shosh, you have, that, could you read that, that last couple of paragraphs after, after Rourke, after Rourke, because there's an important point that I want to make. I don't, I don't remember the exact wording. Tui's face had an expression of attentiveness, of listening quietly to something as simple as fate. Right. He remained silent and Rourke asked, what did you want to say to me? 
till we looked at him and then at the bare trees around them at the river far below at the great rise of the sky beyond the river you know the world of nature the world of reality right. the world of flora right. nothing said tui he walked away his steps creaking on the gravel in the silence sharp and even like the cracks of an engine's pistons rourke yeah. stood alone in the empty driveway looking at the building okay so there's rourke he's alone he's looking at his building right. yeah right yeah there's uh i, I mean wow well, i mean it's so <laughs> It's so deep here. It's almost it's 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 almost unbelievable. I mean, Ayn Rand gives us an entire metaphysical theory in the in in these two characters and in the contrast and the conflict. Because Tui's whole reality is other people. Tui's whole reality is society. Uh, he can't deal with he can't deal with the world of nature at all. He can't uh, he can't he, he's completely uncreative. Ayn Rand never shows him so much as you know hammering nails into a board to make a, a table or a chair, he, he literally never creates anything. The best analogy for him, he's, he's a virus. You know, yes, he, he yes. Lives, uh, he lives parasitically inside uh, of others and he takes them over, he, take, he takes over their, their souls. So his whole reality is social. He can't deal with nature at all. But Rock, of course, Rock the first hander who's focused on nature on, you know, he looks at the, he yes. looks at the, looks at the rocks and he thinks he thinks of the buildings that he could you know he can he can yes. make out of them he looks at the sunlight and he thinks of the he thinks of the light coming in through the windows of of the buildings he, he's going to make he's you know he's the independent thinker he's, he's able to deal with reality to deal with the world of nature to build in nature he's the kind of guy who historically has figured out how to grow crops who's figured out how to cure diseases who's figured out how to how to make the, uh, a, a wheel who's figured out how to make weapons to hunt you know woolly mastodons and so on this is the guy the kind of guy who can deal with reality and and, from, and promote human life and it's great the symbolism at the end as Tui, oh. Tui, Tui just looks at the, what is it, the trees, the sky, the river. River, yeah. Hey, but, oh, the... it's, it's, it's so good because Tui, <laughs> oh, he has been waiting for this moment. He's been hiding out. He's sort of been stalking in place. He's hanging out at that Stoddard Temple just waiting for the moment. And he even admits it. He even admits it. And oh, it, it, oh he's such a phony. Um, the door under the Greek portico opened in a slight, slight, masculine figure, slight versus masculine, right? Came out, it hurried casually down the steps. I would like to see that. How do you hurry casually? <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, I mean, he obviously, yeah. I know, uh, I know, I, 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 get, I get your point, but Tui's, Tui looks, you know, at the trees, the sky, the river, yeah. the world, nature over which he's powerless and the, the man, the, you know, the man who, who's powerful has that power to conquer nature in, in, in support of human life, that's wrong. And so, you know, Tui has, has no power over him. And, and the symbolism is continued brilliantly at the end of, of the novel as Dominique, Mrs. Mrs. Rourke, rises up to the top of the, of the Winan building. And Ayn Rand says she rises above the courthouses. And, and the, the churches. And the churches. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all these social institutions that Tui rules until she comes you know, to the top and it's just the sky and the ocean, you know, and the, and the figure of Howard Rock. It is just nature and the creative mind who can deal effectively with nature. And it's just, it's the symbolism is, it is magnificent. I mean, I mean- just just, Visually, it's great. And Tui yeah. just doesn't get it. I mean, no. Tui here, he says, don't run away. Ha. I mean, who would be likely to run away if, you know, <laughs> the two of them, it's not going to be Rook, don't run away. And then he says, tell me whatever words you wish, no one will hear us, as if Howard Rourke is going to hold back because of what someone might say. So he's sort of trying to turn Rourke into a little Tui, and it isn't working. You know, he, he, can't, he can't get Rourke to play you know, yeah, 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 any game. A, and the scene you referenced before, Shosh, you know, when Tui looks out the window and he has that sickening feeling of, you know, falling to earth and being crushed. Again, the law of gravity, the laws of nature over which he has no control. He can, he can, he can rule society, but he has no 
power to rule nature. But Rourke, Rourke is the you know the Rourke is the guy who who can rule nature, and he says in in the, at the in the Cortland trial, you know, about different kinds of power. There's the, there's so, some men seek survival by, you know, conquering nature and some men seek survival by conquering those who conquer nature. Well, you know, Rock is the one who could conquer nature and Tui is the preeminent well, example of those who try to conquer those who conquer nature. Yeah, and, and he's, yeah, and even Tui, he thinks of going out the window and getting crushed. Yeah. Rourke, if he's gonna take a dive, it's gonna be into the lake. <laughs> right. Just, just saying, you know, he can right. swim his way out of it, yeah. Right. So even there, you know, their, their, their images every, are not of real every, things. At every level, you know, at every level, the plot development, the dialogue, the, the metaphysics expressed here in, the, in, the, in the, the, the philosophy and the metaphysics expressed it in the symbolism. It's so brilliant. You realize, and, and it's, in, it's in your field, Shoshana, uh, the, the, all the literary experts, most overwhelming majority of them, they have no idea that the greatest novelist of history, you know, li lived lived amongst them, produced mm -hmm. these masterpieces, and they don't see it. I mean, most yeah. cases they don't want to see it, but it's it's really. I think the literary world, the, the philosophers are starting to get some interest in Ayn Rand. There's an Ayn Rand Society in the American Philosophical Association, and they discuss Ayn Rand and everything. I th truly think if for the world, the greatest novelist in world literature, the literary professionals will literally be the last people on earth to, to understand her, her literary achievements. So <laughs> you're one of the few. I don't know how many others in the well, Yeah, that was, that was surprising to me, actually. I kind of figured as I grew older, there'd be more people. But what I think actually is in the future, people will look back because, you know, like Rourke, I think that um, reality will come through and people will look back at now and say, what was wrong with them? Yeah. Couldn't, they, couldn't they read? Right, right. There will be, in the future, there will be Ayn Rand scholarship in, in, in literature. It's the same as there is Shakespeare scholarship today. There's be libraries filled with people analyzing the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Which means that some of it won't be good, like the Shakespeare oh, scholarship. No, 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 but 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 at least you know that she's an important writer, and that you. It's a command. She's a command to rise to. You know, like Rourke. Right. There's a, a, something I've noticed when people slam Ayn Rand, and some the very people very rarely slam the Fountainhead. People who are I've I've known I I'm just thinking of a client who came around one time and they saw. The Fountainhead up on my bookshelf, and they said, "Why do you got that book up there?" And I said, I "I'm sorry." And they said, "Why have you got that book up there? That's the book that's read by every douchebag financier on Wall Street." <laughs> and I said, "I've got that book up there because I think it's one of the best books I've ever read and the most uh, profound psychological book I've ever read." And she turned and she said, "It is an excellent book." And I th and this is what I'm you know I'm really sad to say you know I, I hear this all the time with Ayn Rand no one no one this happens all the time like I haven't got time to go into it now but I I used to I used to when when I did some lectures on the happiness at the rehab I worked I would often put Ayn Rand quotations in and some people would go oh she's evil but I love what she says here you know th th this is brilliant she's horrible terrible but this is just brilliant and you know it take it'll take it. It takes time, but you'll say that there will be exactly if we get there, that will happen. So I, I want to wind down today. It's been fantastic. Howard Rourke is such an amazing character that we will be dedicating two episodes. And I've, you know, I really look forward to expanding on what we've been speaking about today and exploring some of the other scenes. There are so many scenes, you know, if, if we miss some out, it's, it's nothing deliberate. <laughs> To those of you who are, who are watching, it's just you know where we're going in the moment in these sessions between us, and uh, I you know I'm incredibly grateful for the two of you for for your time and Razi for putting this on, and I really look forward to our next conversations and discussions around this. And you know, I thank you very much both of you for your time. And oh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, Josh. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks, Shosh, uh, for coming on. <laughs> Shoshana, this was this was fun, and Razi, thanks for for setting this up. Okay, and I will I will add my thanks too. It was a lovely afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, sure Thank it was. You.